Um, I'd like to introduce our three panelists, Ben Gidley, Lillian Turk, and Diana Clark. First up is Ben. Ben Gidley is a senior lecturer and assistant dean in the School of Social Sciences, History, and Philosophy at Birkbeck University of London, as well as an associate of the Pears Institute for the Study of Antisemitism. His publications include Turbulent Times, The British Jewish Community Today, and Antisemitism and Islamophobia in Europe, A Shared Story, question mark. He is currently completing a manuscript on Jewish radicalism in early 20th, 20th century London for Manchester University Press. Please welcome Ben. Great. So first of all, thank you so much to um, Spencer and the other organizers for inviting me. I'm really happy to be here, really happy that this uh, day has taken place and that it's, there's been such interest in it. Um, I'm going to talk about uh, London, about the Yiddish anarchist scene in London, and in particular about uh, Rudolf Rocker, who a number of people have already mentioned, who was a key figure in that scene, but also in transnational anarchism in the US and France and Germany and elsewhere, um, and try and locate him within his context and uh, say a little bit about what that says about Yiddish anarchism. I'll just really briefly introduce the Yiddish East End. The story is more or less exactly the same as that of the Lower East Side, except a couple of differences. It was somewhat smaller. There was about 100,000 uh, Jewish migrants in the East End of London, um, a rapidly proletarianizing population, um, often that came from further south in the Russian Empire than the people that came to New York often came from less urban backgrounds. And so the kind of proletarianization experience was maybe more uh, dramatic than it was in, in New York. There was a kind of a Yiddish cultural scene in London. It's been um, under-recognized, I think, in the study of Yiddish uh, culture. Um, this is an important new book by Vivi Lacks about uh, Yiddish music in London. Um, there's a couple of reasons why Yiddish didn't flourish in London as much as it did in New York. One was the kind of really strong assimilation of the Jewish communal leadership who did everything they could to stamp out Yiddish culture, including trying to get Yiddish theaters like this closed down. Um, and the other reason was because many of the key figures in Yiddish culture in London came to New York because they got better jobs more easily in New York. So Saul Yanofsky, who we've heard about, um, uh, Edelstadt, who we've heard about, people that briefly were in London often came to New York because it was a more lucrative place to be a Yiddish editor or writer. Um, not that it was particularly lucrative here. Um, the socialist movement in London starts in the 1870s, initially as... Um, neither an anarchist nor a Marxist or a social democratic movement, but as a populist, Narodnik movement. So the Narodniks believed in going to the people. And some Russian-speaking upper-class, well, relatively privileged Russian Jews who were in London believed that they should go to the Jewish people. And so they weren't Yiddish speakers. They had to learn Yiddish in order to kind of preach socialism to the Yiddish-speaking workers in London. But very rapidly out of this kind of Narodnik scene, there was a kind of flowering of very of many different currents of uh, Yiddish language socialism. Morris Vinchevsky, who many of you will have heard of, um, was in London and uh, worked on these two very early um, Yiddish socialist papers. Um, the Arbeiter Friend, you've already heard about a little, started off as a socialist paper and later under Yanofsky became an anarchist paper. The Yiddish socialists were very closely connected to the kind of mainstream of um, English socialism, which in the late 19th century had kind of two main traditions. Um, William Morris um, was the main figure in the Socialist League, which was a Marxist but libertarian kind of leaning organization. Henry Hindeman, um, Social Democratic Federation, more kind of orthodox Marxist. And these two movements had a lot of connections with Jewish workers, um, Yiddish-speaking workers in the East End of London. And a really important moment in this history, in 1888, 1889, was what was called the New Unionism, where workers in the East End of London who had traditionally been outside the mainstream labor movement, kind of outside the craft unions that had been formed in the 19th century, were very rapidly unionized, um, went on strikes on a huge scale. Uh, women workers, uh, the, the mainly Catholic workers on the, um, on the riverside, on the docks. Um, and there was a kind of different, a, a changing mood within the socialist movement that was much more orientated towards kind of grassroots, rank and file, um, 
less kind of less the labor aristocracy and more the kind of most casualized workers. And anarchists, um, Mannering and Leggett in the East End, and syndicalists or people that became syndicalists were really important in kind of knitting together the socialist movement um, and the ideas of the socialist movement, the anarchist movement, and the workers in the East End. And this was reflected in the in the um, textile industry, which was the main um, Jewish working class sector in East London. And the new unionism, as well as the dockers and the match girls, um, the garment workers went on strike, very large scale strike, thousands of workers. And the two key organizers, Lewis Lyons and Wolf Vess, were attached to the two main socialist groups. So Lyons was a social democrat, um, uh, Wolf Vess was in the uh, Socialist League, William Morris and around that time became an anarchist and started translating anarchist texts into Yiddish. Uh, this is uh, Elise Recluse's um, uh, anarchism and address translated into Yiddish. And so really from the 1890s increasingly, but especially from the 1900s, anarchism became um, one of the main movements within the Yiddish scene in East London. And I think it's fair to say that in the 1900s, 1910s, it was the dominant, it was the largest um, socialist um, movement in the, in the Yiddish-speaking working class. So the Workers' Friends paper had a circulation of something like 5,000. The theoretical journal, um, Germanal, there's a copy um, in one of the vitrines outside here, um, which is a, quite a highbrow literary journal, had a circulation of 2,500, uh, 2, which is pretty significant in a, in a, Jewish, a Yiddish-speaking community that was um, not much more than 100,000. So they launched newspapers, they launched literary journals, they had a club, the Jubilee Street Club, that's a poster for Emma Goldman coming to speak at the Jubilee um, Street Club. Um, they were heavily, like the Union of Russian Workers, they were heavily involved in labor movement activism, uh, the Jewish bakers, the Jewish garment workers, working very closely with the mainly Catholic dock workers who shared the same neighborhood as them, um, had a series of kind of strike waves in the 1900s, and the 1910s that connected kind of um, the syndicalist movement with the kind of day-to-day uh, -day concerns of the East London working class. 1910, 1911, there was a major strike wave um, that, uh, again, as with the 1889 New Unionism, it was really focused on the kind of most um, casualized sectors of the working class, such as the dockers. The dock, strike, the dock workers of East London went on strike in autumn 1911. The Jewish working class um, that lived kind of next to them were really instrumental in kind of uh, working with the leaders of the dockers union and kind of organizing the day-to-day -day, um, day -day business of the strike. And really the dockers strike inspired uh, the tailors, the mainly Jewish tailors who lived in the same area to go on strike um, the following year. Uh, Yaakov Kaplan, his partner Rosa Kaplan, were the key kind of trade union organizers who were anarchists. And th um, something like uh, 10,000 garment workers went on strike um, in 1912. Later in 1912, the dockers went on strike again. Um, so the two, the two kind of the, the um, English-speaking, mainly Catholic working class that lived on the riverside and the Yiddish-speaking working class that lived um, also in the East End, kind of had a kind of symbiotic relationship. And the reason I've called these, uh, this section syndicalism and gefilte fish is because there's stories of anarchist, um, anarchist women making gefilte fish for the dockers, taking gefilte fish to the, um, to the dock workers to feed them, but also taking in the children of dock workers while the dock workers were on strike, which was reciprocated when the tailors were on strike, dock, dock working families took the Jewish children of the, um, of the strikers in when they uh, during the period when they had no income. This kind of flowering of anarchist and syndicalist organization, um, the kind of real key figure in this movement was uh, Rudolf Rocker, who you've um, already met from a few uh, presentations earlier. Rocker was born in 1873 in the German Rhineland. He came from a a Catholic family, not a very observant Catholic family, a kind of family of craftspeople. I think his father was a lithographer. He was a bookbinder. And it's with many kind of people from that sort of artisanal um, uh, kind of milieu at the time. Part of the apprenticeship was really traveling, traveling around uh, kind of market towns, kind of developing your trade. 
And so Rocker kind of moved around developing his trade as a young man, got involved in the, social Demo um, the German Social Democratic Party as a socialist and then under the influence of uh, Johann Most, who, as we've heard earlier, was a really charismatic figure, um, was won over to anarchism. Rocker spent some time um, in Paris. Um, he, as a bookbinder, he shared a bookbinding workshop with Anski, um, the writer uh, and, and ethnographer connected with, uh, with Yivo. Apparently, Anski was not a very good bookbinder, um, <laughs> but him and Rocker shared tools. Rocker taught him some kind of techniques, but um, Rocker started to learn about um, the Yiddish-speaking world. He went along to Yiddish anarchist meetings in Paris. It's the first time he encountered Yiddish anarchists. As a German speaker, he could kind of understand more or less what was going on. And he was struck in particular by the fact that um, in the anarchist scene, in contrast, in the Yiddish anarchist scene, in contrast to the French speaking and the German scene that he was used to, uh, women played an, equal, an equally active part as men. And that was for him one of the really kind of appealing features, the equality between the genders is one of the appealing features of the Yiddish anarchist scene. Um, he went to London um, f uh, really to just to inquire about his uh, visa status with the German government. He was um, wanted by the law in Germany, and he thought it would be better to talk to the German consulate in London. And he kind of uh, just ended up staying there, um, fell in love with a Ukrainian uh, Jewish woman, Millie Whitcock, who was also an anarchist. Um, and got very heavily involved in the, the Yiddish anarchist scene. He learned Yiddish, he learned to write in Yiddish. His Yiddish always, was always kind of quite Germanic. Um, it often reads as German in Hebrew letters. Um, and some of his translations were probably more transliterations, but he, he played a really important part in translating uh, Nietzsche, translating um, Scandinavian, French, kind of modernist writers into Yiddish and creating a real kind of Yiddish literary culture, a huge kind of publication output. And if you look at the list of anarchist publications that are here at Yivo, you'll see a huge number were published in London by Rocker and his um, circle. Avram Frumkin was uh, a really gifted translator that worked with him. Uh, Rocker learned to print. This is uh, Naroditsky's print shop. Naroditsky was a Talmudic scholar, anarchist, and printer who printed... Um, both English, Hebrew, and Yiddish texts um, and worked with Rocker. They printed Germanal there. Rocker was described by many of the um, Yiddish anarchists, the younger Yiddish anarchists, as their rabbi. Um, he was kind of uh, devoted to kind of an educational uplift of the community. And the kind of practice of translation that he was involved in was really kind of um, central to kind of building up the kind of literary culture and political culture of the Yiddish-speaking working class. Millie Whitcock, his partner, um, she was one of three anarchist sisters. Uh, her um, younger sister, Rose Whitcock, um, lived with Guy Aldred, who was a um, kind of libertarian communist. Um, and the third sister, whose name was escaped my mind, is, uh, was also a, an anarchist who also married a non-Jewish non anarchist. And the Rocker years, the years when the kind of uh, Yiddish anarchist scene was dominated by Rudolf Rocker in London, were extremely kind of rich, extremely rich period for Yiddish anarchism. I think um, the kind of global, um, constantly circulating um, anarchist milieu, we've heard about speakers that went from one country to another on speaking tours, <coughs> And many of the kind of key um, anarchi American anarchists spent time in London and vice versa. Lucy Parsons, who we've already heard of, was a frequent speaker at the Jubilee Street Club. Louise Michel lived in London. Um, Kropotkin was living in uh, suburban London. And Kropotkin and Rocker were very close friends. And Kropotkin often spent time um, at, the, at the Yiddish clubs of East London. So it was very much a global... Uh, London was kind of a node in a global Yiddish anarchist network. And this was a network which faced both East and West. It faced East in two ways. It was um, uh, solidarity with the victims of pogroms uh, in the 1880s, but especially after Kishinev um, was a kind of really big part of anarchist organization. But also London was a big place for publishing Yiddish texts written um, in Eastern Europe. Okay, so I'm running out of time. Um, 
I just want to really briefly just say a couple of things about kind of what made this scene distinctive. One of them was um, a focus on libertarian living, like prefigurative, as we've heard, culture kind of um, that included free love. When uh, Millie and Rudolph tried to come to America in the 1890s, the immigration authorities told them they needed to get married, and um, the uh, immigration officer said that if you're not married, you're living in free love, and that's, that's sinful. And Millie said, if love is not free, it's prostitution. So there's a real kind of culture of, of free living, free schools, libertarian education, um, a kind of refusal of a kind of teleological politics in favor of a politics of the here and now, of kind of mutual aid, satisfying kind of, of uh, needs, contemporary needs in the East End of London. And a kind of um, constant tension between an internationalist, a cosmopolitan identity, and a, and a Yiddish diasporic identity, that particularly in the wake of the pogroms. And then finally, um, uh, a, a culture of translation, a kind of culture that actively celebrated this multilingual, um, multilingual kind of uh, living of the, of the Jewish East End that was happy to move back and forth between languages and translate the universal internationalist messages of anarchism into a specifically Yiddish and specifically Jewish kind of idiom in order to kind of root itself in the working class of the East End. So I'll stop there. Thank you very much. Next up is Lillian Turk, a research associate at the Institute for Jewish Philosophy and Religion at Hamburg University. Her research focuses on theories of religion and religious anarchism in Yiddish literature. She holds a magister in Jewish studies and political sciences and wrote her PhD thesis on religious nonconformism and cultural dynamics at Leipzig University. This thesis locates the writings of the Russian Yiddish anarchist Abba Gordon among his contemporaries and looks at his role in defining anarchist boundaries towards religious ideas. Turk is currently preparing a monograph on the concept of God in Gordon's writings. Please welcome Lillian Turk. Um, yes. Good evening, or good afternoon, uh, good late afternoon. Um, I thank the organizers for inviting this very wonderful conference, and also I thank you for inviting me. Um, the last time I was in this room, it was in 2010. Um, we were celebrating the end of the Yiddish summer program, and um, that was uh, very, uh, it was a time that gave me, gave me experiences. I met people who are now in this room, and um, I had the honor to go to the Bain, Bain Bridgivka and meet Bela Schechter Gottesmann. So um, it all came, at, it, Ivo had played a part in this uh, development. Um, okay. I will speak about Abba Gordon. You've heard about him in uh, the previous panel and the dis dispute on religious anarchism in Freie Arbeiterstimme. We've, we have heard about the early anti-religious activities among Jewish anarchists um, in the first panel, Tom Goyens, and um, what I did in my research, I read Freie Arbeiterstimme and compared different argumentative strategies, um, and it became obvious that the activities that Tom Goyens described, the, the, uh, the Yom Kippur Bella, the, the balls on Yom Kippur, and um, that were, uh, that made, well, they were spectacular, and they coined the Yiddish anarchist self-identifications. These um, activities became the dominant tradition. So atheism was a dominant, the dominant tradition within Yiddish anarchism, and it was still pre prevailing in the self-perceptions and attributions as well in the 1930s and 1940s. So what I did is I compared 
um, different argumentative strategies, I looked at the way religion was either defended or rejected, then compared these arguments and rhetoric means and found that religious anarchists, it's a, a preliminary term, put most efforts in redefining Jewish anarchism. Concepts like free thinking were adjusted or new differences drawn out and underlined, for example, between religion and religiosity, so that you can save one part and uh, reject the other. I will get to that in a little, in a, in a little while. Re religious socialists and anarchists demanded for each and every individual the kingdom, kingdom of God realized in this world, and they turned for this purpose towards the teachings of the prophets among others, that the soul and absolute law of God exclude, excludes any other claim to absoluteness, not only by the representatives of God on earth, but also by the state. It reconstitutes the tight bond between God and the people. This bond between God and the people is, con is um, conceptualized in different ways, and this is um, what I would like to do in the next year's look at the ways how religious anarchists um, defined the bond between God and the people. So ask the question if we can speak of different shades within religious, Jewish religious anarchism. And I see Gordon as one example. Um, so how do uh, anarchists define the relationship between God and the people? This is where we turn to Abba Gordon. Since we have two lectures on him, I would like to take a little bit of time of uh, saying some, giving you some biographical details. He was born in 1887 in Michalishok near Vilnius, uh, started writing in Hebrew, Russian, and Yiddish from 1909, took part in the Russian, Revolution, uh, in, yeah, in the Ru Russian revolutions in 1905, uh, was arrested for a prison break, and then took part, it was in Moscow in 1917, uh, 18. We heard about that in the last panel, and had to flee from the Soviets in, uh, and emigrated to uh, the US in 1926. And in the 1930s and 40s, he published a lot of his works in Yiddish, uh, among them the, uh, so the, the main work is a trilogy on Jewish ethics, in the end, by the end of the 1930s, but also um, a biography of Shaul Yanovsky, whom we've heard of today, and um, historical works on Ru the Russian revolutions. Um, and in, he came to the US in 1956, uh, excuse me, to Israel in 1956, and then he started writing in Hebrew, translated some of his own works, but also translated Peter Kropotkin's um, Anarchist Morals, um, and Etienne de la Boétie, Discours de la Servitude Volontaire, into Hebrew. And yes, so he published, his main oeuvre is in Yiddish, especially in the 1930s and 40s, he published at least one book every year, and that continued in, until the 1950s. <coughs> Abba Gordon himself was a very disputed figure. He developed a theology of the individual, as I would call it, uh, in which the concept of the one and absolute self is a central category, a category both human and divine. The individual and uh, the social uh, are, link are linked to the anarchist idea of humankind as passionate and spiritually <coughs> meaningful whole. Gordon is particularly interesting to me because he proposes his ideas within a larger context of a turn towards Jewish traditional sources in former clearly anti-religious circles. Atheists like Shmuel Rabinovich described this development in political terms as a swing to the right within, for, within radical circles. This turn is a part of a subcultural transformation in the 1920s and 1930s, which can be seen as a reaction to one, what Kenyon Zimmer has described as the decline, and others before him has described as the decline of Yiddish anarchism in the 1930s, especially after the Spanish um, Civil War, 
and two, as a reaction to the spiritual crisis of Judaism, which the historian Jonathan Sana has described. Despite the prevailing anti-religious tendency in Jewish anarchist thought, I was astonished to see the rich variety of arguments for and against the study of religious texts that was published in Freie Arbeiterstimme. So you see a line from Anarchia maybe to Freie Arbeiterstimme, they were very open to uh, radical ideas, um, even if they contradict each other. In the remaining minutes, I would like to give you an overview of this variety by starting with the relationship of reli <coughs> religion and knowledge. Religion either obstructed knowledge or is seen as cause to the strive to higher being, to education and culture. And in the second step, I turn to the claim that religion is either a configuration of power or religion and power are not related at all. So the first part is about knowledge and the second about power. Human reason is the single criterion of truth. Reason is calculability, predictability, comparability, provability, and more importantly, a means of self-liberation as opposed to the, to the histories and legends of the religious tradition. This, is a very wide, this was a very widespread assumption and view on religion, and it is the argument that the atheist Naiman, whom I didn't find a, a first name yet, Naiman made in 1938, who attacked the new trend towards religious radicalism, which directs Jews away from the scientific worldview and calls back to the ghetto, back to the times of Mount Sinai, back to the study of Torah through which he wrote, they think the Messiah will come. Here it was it's clear that the purpose of knowledge uh, is a crucial element. The study of Torah and the trust in the coming of the Messiah deflects Jews from the path of creating a just world. To Naiman, religion leads directly to self gatoization The believer cuts herself off voluntarily from worldly literature, immerses herself into the seclu secluded solitary of a monastery, and religious fanatism takes over social life. Any religion claims absolute truth and appoints its adherents to be superior to other people. Now this point, superiority, is it is at this point when Abagordin sparked the debate on religious anarchism. In his view, Judaism uh, is the chosen people. It is bound by ethical principles. Yiddishkeit is a way of living in difference, in separation from the politically organized Gentiles. Therefore, Naiman's accusation of self-ghettoization seemingly comes true. Gordon, however, answers that he freely and gladly rejects a world organized in nation states, which achieve rec recognition through economic advantages and, more importantly, through the use of military force. Gordon shares the idea of the particular task of Judaism, which is uh, which at this time is promulgated by Reform Judaism, if you think of the uh, Columbus Platform in 1937. According to Is Isaiah 49, Israel is the light among the nations. It is the people joined in soul and task to set an example of social justice, freedom, spirituality, and morality. Exile is a precondition to fulfill this task not an obstacle. We could even take a step further and answer Naiman following Gording. It is not self-separation that prevents social change. Rather, it is the Gentile nations and national states which exclude morals and social justice. Gordon sees God certainly not as a supernatural uh, entity who brings about miracles and has influence on natural law. Rather, God dwells in each and every one. Though transcending time and space, he is present in daily life, 
in history and in the enhancement of humanity by strengthening its self-consciousness. Another author, Tzvi Kahan, defended the function which reeds and religious symbols fulfilled against the view they were merely an expression of superstitious belief. Rel religious symbols create unity, he wrote, and remind of the intent and purpose of creation. They express religious yearning, an emotion which causes all strife to higher being, to education and culture. It urges men towards the realization of divine order reflected in arts, literature, and poetry. Likewise, this, this was Zwika Hahn, and likewise the impressionist poet Joshua Tenenboim emphasized unity, closeness, and intimacy between God and men. Tenenboim published this review on Chaim Rosenblatt's new collections of poems on biblical motifs in 1944, in which the need of connection to God is expressed, to which other authors referred as well. For example, we go back to Zvi Kahan, who quotes the 18th century Christian theologian Friedrich Schleiermacher, who described religiosity as, emo as emotion, as Gemütsbewegung. In his treaty on religion, speeches to its cultured despisers in 1799, I quote, Religion is the outcome neither of the fear of death nor the fear of God. It answers a deep need in man. It is neither a metaphysic nor a morality, but above all and essentially an intuition and a feeling. Religion is the miracle of direct relationship with the divine. So, so far we have looked at four authors. Naiman, the anti-religious atheist, demands a certain type of knowledge that is provided by uh, natural sciences. Gordon, Zwickahan, and Tenenboim, however, endeavor to defend the search for God as a spiritual need of man. The atheist side answers to this in scorn and derision. For example, Avram Goldman wrote in 1943, that it falls into the duties of the poet to think up anecdotes on intent and purpose of creation. And Goldman's argument is the one we will turn to now in the last part of this chapter paper, as he argues that uh, religion is a configuration of power which creates dependency. Goldman described God as an irrational power which despite its all-embracing capability consumes the smallest worm on earth. It is insatiable and even consumes the bird along with the worm. God examines, tests one's credibility. He is omnipotent yet merciless, meticulous and vengeful, greedy and voracious in his demands of sacrifice. Yet. This divine power is dependent on expressing this power. It is itself in need of subjugation and demonstrations of power. The classic anti-religious atheist, uh, anti-religious argument. Uh, the answer to Goldman is given by Almi, Elia Chaim ben Shlomo Simon Sheps, whose argument aims at the concept of power. It is not religion or a foreign power that invades people's lives and subjugates individuals. Evil does not come from a celestial sphere, but from human beings, from, I quote, a pack of raging tyrants and malicious autocrats. Power is a creation of humankind and not part of God's revelation. In Ami's case, God's power is not absolute, as in Goldman's case, but just a different interpretation. If he, I quote, if one believes that no blade of grass moves within God's will, then he must conclude that God is behind the crimes of Hitler and Mussolini. If God was omnipotent, then it was either not important for the divine to occupy himself with men, or he enjoys human suffering. I come to a conclusion. You've heard of four different and partly contradictory approaches towards religion which were present in Freie Arbeiterstimme between 1937 and 1945. 
the classic anti-religious position, Naiman and Goldman, Almi the agnostic, the religious national, Gordon, and the spiritual arguments by Zwicker Hahn and Tenenboim. The debate on reason, knowledge, power, and religion is in its foundations a debate on the nature of man and on the assumptions we have of humanity, bound or not bound to images of the divine. For religious anarchists, man is more than mere matter, calculable according to natural law. She is consciousness, confidence, perception, interest, excitement, awareness, premonition, and supposition. Social change would not be postponed into a distant future, but would come into being before and during the process of a changing social world. That means it is individual transformation that leads to social transformation. It is before and during the process of the change that <coughs> individuals change first before you wait for uh, a changing social order. Thank you. Last but certainly not least, thanks. Last but certainly not least, Diana Clark is a doctoral student in history at the University of Pittsburgh and a managing editor at Inge Webe, a journal of Yiddish studies. Woo! Their research interrogates the borders of whiteness in rural spaces, particularly the way Jews immigrating from Europe to the, to the United States in the early 20th, 20th century understood and negotiated their own racialization and were racialized in Appalachia and the American South. Clark is currently translating the work of the Yiddish poet Rigel Zishlinski and is working on a book about diners. Their writing and translations have appeared in World Literature Today, The Village Voice, Descent, and A Rainbow Thread, an anthology of queer Jewish texts. Please welcome Diana Clark. Um, hi. hi. <laughs> I'm really glad to be here. Thank you all so much for being here. Um, and I want to acknowledge also being on traditional Lenape and Canarsi land. Um, and it feels really important to me as I'm talking about, we're, I'm talking a little bit about the 1930s, but I'm also talking about now. And this room is full of people who have helped, who do help me learn about anarchism and Yiddish. And also we're all in the room learning about anarchism and Yiddish together right now, so that's everybody, right? And like, that's how it happens is it keeps going. Uh, and relationships feel to me so integral to this work and to sort of what I'm gonna be talking about, so I wanna invite you all into that with me. Um, and so what I'm gonna be talking about uh, starts last fall. Um, I was in Pittsburgh and feeling pretty sort of far from myself in this tradition of Yiddish anarchism, and I turn as one does to Yiddish Adichterins, uh, Ezra Corman's uh, Anthology of Poetry by Yiddish Women Writers from uh, 1586 to 1929, the year of its publication. Uh, many of the poets who were still living at the time of the volume's publication, uh, they have photos pasted in the book under their names, as intimate as like a yearbook or even a photo album. And one photo I hadn't noticed before on, a pre on previous uh, nights turning these pages and seeking recognition was of the Ukrainian Yiddish poet Anyuta Pyatigorskaya. Uh, she's wearing wire-rimmed glasses on a chain, dark hair pinned up, practical clothes. Her portrait echoes the familiar image of Emma Goldman, which you know we've seen already multiple times today, and uh, decorates and sometimes signifies so many contemporary anarchist spaces, uh, Yiddish and not. And so then there's this familiarity and novelty, right? This image that's so like this other Yiddish sort of adjacent anarchist who I know. And I start reading. Uh, the first of Piatigorskaya's poems featured in Corman's anthology, which afterwards appeared in her 1930 collection, In Gang, is called Tsigainerin. Uh, like the English term traveler, uh, Tsigainer is a Yiddish word for a Roma person, and the in ending feminizes the word, which more, sort of more literally what translates to wanderer. Uh, the poem goes like this. If the whole world is my home, then what is a fence? Who is a fence? In big cities where streets spread away from the plaza, I lay out my linens, and scatter over them my bits of drying grain. Every passerby looks on as I anchor the linens with stones. They question me, 
and I must tell each one of them what only I know, that the whole world is my home. Right? And so this lights me up. This poem, which is focusing on an act that's both you know, practical and domestic, and in that radical, right? Like, let us not imagine that those qualities are separate. Laying out a sheet to dry grain becomes a way to claim public space as intimate, a home for the central figure specifically and for anyone else who cares to notice the possibility of it. I love the way the central figure of the poem explains to each confounded passerby the easy rightness of her understanding, perhaps with incredulity but without derision, right? I know, the whole world is my home. Um, so where else, if not in this plaza, should, be, be, should she be, right? It's as natural as sitting in her kitchen. And so I also wonder, reading this, about Piatigorskaya's use of the idea of a Roma woman to imagine a world with no fences, right? Um, and there's an easy and available parallel to be made between the experiences of, and I want to say also like profoundly inexact, uh, between the experiences of Jewish and Roma peoples, both of whom historically have been nationless and diasporic, particularly in the European context from which Piatigorskaya is writing. Um, but so then I ask myself, you know, why would Piatigorskaya, rather than exploring the ways in which uh, Yiddish itself, her first language and the language of her poetry um, is challenging the no notion of the state by its own statelessness. We know we've heard a lot about that from other folks and instead uses the image um, and ostensibly the voice of a Roma woman to illustrate the idea of a borderless locality and a local borderlessness. And that's really complicated. Um, Tsiganerin with its anti-statist themes um, is first likely first published of all places in the Kharkiv-based Soviet state-sponsored communist Yiddish literary journal Deroite Welt, or The Red World. Of course, right? State sponsorship of the journal and other cultural projects um, is this really powerful political gesture of the Soviet state, um, both of Jewish belonging and some control, coercion and maybe into the Soviet communist project. And so even with Deroite Welt's relatively permissive editorial policy, there would not have been room for a critique of the state that explicit. Um, in 1929, the Yiddish poet Leib Kvitko was booted from his editorial role in the magazine after publishing a book titled Gerangel, or Struggle. And the Soviet state's extremely contingent gesture of Jewish belonging um, you know, is operating also in this sort of larger cyclical system of uh, anti-Semitic uh, contingent safety. Um, it's easier not to critique the state or not to be so explicit about it when the harm isn't coming directly or when not critiquing keeps further harm from coming. It's too easy to say that Piatigorskaya also exploits the social meaning of Roma people among her Jewish readers to make an anarchist argument for a borderless world. Is she imagining solidarities between Jewish and Roma people? Is she gesturing at solidarity and not quite getting it right? What would getting it right mean? Among the Yiddish modernist poets I study, it's common to find writers with the intention of solidarity and struggle using the experiences of differently racialized people to make ostensibly universal arguments or assume shared understanding that sometimes elides difference or else uses that difference as a tool for Jewish self-reflection. For instance, Adam Zachary Newton describes the phenomenon of Yiddish writers imagining black people as, quote, people more Jewish than the Jews, end quote. And Rachel Rubenstein's book, Members of the Tribe, is rife with accounts of Jewish and specifically Yiddish representations of native people as a way to think through Jewishness in the context of nationalism and communism. Rubenstein writes, quote, cultures, especially a particularly syncretic Jewish culture, as David Biala argues, continually refine, revise, and reinvent themselves in response to and in, act, and in interaction with other cultures. So what about placing Piatigorskaya and her poetics in an anarchist tradition? Although Piatigorskaya identified as a communist and not, as far as I know, as an anarchist explicitly, she was born in Zhitomir, Ukraine, which was a hub of anarchist and anarcho-communist organizing by Yiddish-speaking Jews in the early 20th century, as we heard specifically after uh, some right-wing pogroms, um, as was Kiev, where she lived when her, um, when her poem was published. She even dedicated her first book, In Gang, to David Hofstein, another Yiddish poet and member of the Jewish Anti-Fascist Committee, who was later by Stalin's orders arrested and executed, along with Leib Kvitko, on the night of the murdered poets in 1952. Um, and the content of Piatigorskaya's poem itself is so clearly invested in the refusal of borders and of private property. The whole world is my home. Uh, Read through another lens, though, that line could be a gesture of entitlement. The whole world is my home, which is where, uh, the, which is where that recognition can get really uncomfortable. Um, and I think this uh, is sort of a gentle aside, but is uh, also me asking, you know, 
who feels comfortable in which anarchist spaces, um, how do the poetics of anarchist spaces and the art that's asked into anarchist spaces, uh, who does that invite in? Um, in some ways, I appreciated that Tsigaynerin does not treat Yiddish as inherently anarchist or inherently challenging to borders, um, which is you know, an objectifying mythos that still exists. Um, and it also points to the ways in which Yiddish anarchism spring from Russian European anarchist traditions that articulate a really particular sort of theoretically explicit um, literary, literary and uh, written political tradition of anarchism. Um, that also carries with it some of the presumptive and appropriate violences of Western culture. So what does the tradition of Yiddish anarchism bring into the present? Uh, what elements of the past do we map onto contemporary Yiddish and Yiddish-inflected anarchisms? What are the poetics of anarchism in contemporary uses of Yiddish? And more specifically, how does post-vernacular Yiddish function as a signal in, an anar in anarchist communities? And I come to this in a large part because I moved to Pittsburgh two years ago said that I knew Yiddish, and the anarchists were like, great, come. And I realized I had this tool in my pocket that I didn't understand and didn't know how to use, and so I am now reading this paper to you about it. Um, <laughs> uh, so briefly, post-vernacular Yiddish, as Jeffrey Chandler puts it, is a kind of performance art, a, quote, new semiotic mode for the language, every utterance is enveloped in a performative aura, freighted with significance as a speech act quite apart uh, from the meaning of whatever words are spoken. Shanther calls this, quote, complex phenomenon a, com a consequence of the Holocaust. Within less than a decade, almost half of the world's Yiddish speakers were murdered, and the language's centuries-old cultural heartland in Eastern Europe was demolished, end quote. Shanther's point being that the loss of a Yiddish-speaking cultural world heightens each subsequent utterance of Yiddish to a role of meaning-making beyond its function. And I think something similar happened for Yiddish anarchism. What does it perform in the present? Uh, so for some answers, I looked at two contemporary anarchist, either explicitly or implicitly, cultural product, projects that use Yiddish in their framing. Uh, the first is the punk band Koit Fardain Fardacht, hello, <laughs> um, uh, which uh, the name translates to the filth of your suspicion, um, and they play, quote, uh, Yiddish anarchist and Bundist songs and some other Yiddish radical tunes, soundtracks to strikes, uprisings, assassinations, revolutionary movements from Odessa, Vilna to New York, Galveston, Buenos Aires, Havana, end quote. Uh, this, comes, this description comes from a zine of lyrics that they put out last year, which another friend brought to me right in the sort of like relational mode of sh anarchist and Yiddish learning. Um, the name of the band comes from a poem by Celia Dropkin, in Koit Fardain Fardacht, and the slight alteration of the poem's language and the band's name by shifting participles allows me to think a little bit about the nuances of the phrase itself, right? Like, whose filth, whose suspicion, yours or mine, who's, um, who's ashamed, how delicious is it to claim filth, delicious to be filthy, to be just as bad as your enemies and detractors imagine you to be, um, right? So the, in this zine, the self-description of the band continues, quote, our Ashkenazi culture is alive and well despite the best efforts of Zionists, Nazis, Enlighteners, fundamentalists, assimilationists, necro-nostalgists. Uh, <laughs> Yiddish has never been the only... <laughs> Thank you. Uh, <laughs> uh, Yiddish has never been the only language of Ashkenaz, but for 1,000 years it has been one of our cultural anchors, especially for women, for the proste folk, for the kulturtours, for the rev revolutionisten. Uh, and as we add our own links to the golden akate, we embrace it as a mark of both our diasporism, one Jewish language among many, and our indigeneity, one Eastern European language among many. Um, and so this gives us both a real like particularity um, and a connection in particularity um, by naming what's specific about this tradition. Um, and this offers a radical departure from the internationalist uh, Europeanized anarchism uh, that Piatigorskaya's poem suggests and engages quite differently with the intersection of Yiddish and indigeneity from what Rubinstein describes. Uh, by aligning themselves with Dropkin's queer erotic poetics, the band locates themselves as queer Yiddish lyricists, uh, and their celebration of filth implies a solidarity um, with other people who, with people who are like maybe getting overlooked, who are maybe like told like the filth is where you belong. Like, no, that's that's everybody, right? Um, and so rather than right, racializing or generalizing. Um, we get granular in particular, um, and okay, I could go on, I'll stop. Um, 
I, I guess one thing I want to read is a lyric from Siddharth S. Azoi Zain, or Does It Have to Be This Way, which is a song they, um, that they perform. Uh, Does it have to be this way? Must it be this way that one person's luck is predestined and for the next everything is forbidden? Right? So asking right into that question of why do maybe only some people have to be in filth and what, you know, how else could that be? Um, and the other Yiddish adjacent cultural project that I'm looking to is Linka Flegel, which maybe some folks know. Um, uh, Self-described, quote, queer Jewish chicken farm and cultural organizing project uh, in the Hudson Valley of New York, whose name means left wing, making both a political pun and a gesture to the physicality of chickens, which perhaps is a way for us to think about theory in practice. Um, <laughs> uh, uh, so Linka Flegel, quote, uh, grows a Jewish culture aligned with values of diasporism, anti-oppression, and dreaming the world to come. We see being in deep solidarity as part of a vibrant Judaism and honor this practice through our relationships to people, networks, and movements, end quote. Um, in practice, in my experience, uh, Linka Flegel works in solidarity with other farms in the land it shares, which are queer and POC owned and oriented toward movement organizing and also hosts intentional Jewish holiday gatherings in which work, ritual, and relaxation are organized in the moment by the people in the space according to their collective needs and desires. But it's neither my desire nor my capacity to describe or assess the totality of the anarchisms practiced in either of these exciting projects. Rather, I look to the ways they each use Yiddish in the naming of the projects to signal, perhaps flag, anarchism, uh, that both um, are, are really explicitly queer projects, um, and that's not incidental. What's new is not the campy quality of post-vernacular Yiddish, but what the performance signals. Because Chandler describes how in post-vernacular Yiddish, the symbolic value of the language, regardless of its use, signifies orality and vernacularity. And I argue that in certain spaces, the symbolic value of post-vernacular Yiddish uh, can come to signal, in certain subcultures, to signal anarchism itself, but not because Yiddish is or is framed as inherently anarchist, rather because the history and tradition of Yiddish anarchism is surfacing and being celebrated. Here we are in it, and having a shared symbolic system uh, for recognition and to ask ourselves and each other to do better is a really powerful tool. And I think that's what's so exciting to me about these two projects I'm describing is that they're taking the Yiddish anarchist tradition and saying like, how can the solidarity be better? How can it really mean showing up to more people? Um, so wary of mapping the present onto the past, I think of all the Emma Goldman posters in all the anarchist bookstores I've ever visited. Um, uh, Goldman gave some speeches in Yiddish, right, as we heard, um, but never felt comfortable in the language. And so my question is, was she flagging with it too? Um, it only works in a context where the person flagging needs to be seen because they're a minority in their current environment. And in Goldman's linguistically mixed American anarchist milieu, Yiddish meant something quite different than in the dense Yiddish literary political scene that Piatigorskaya inhabited, even if Yiddish was marginalized in the Soviet context. Um, with that in mind, I revisit Piatigorskaya's larger body of work and notice her repeated use, like many Yiddish poets of the era, of the image of the threshold, the shvel. Um, and in your knock, that's a poem, she writes, quote, will you come back, will you find a path that leads to my threshold? Uh, in From a Letter, she writes, quote, of course it's easier when home is bordered only by a common threshold, end quote. Uh, and so many Yiddish poets use this term in part because it's, right, it's common, it's shared, like everybody walks over doors, we know about doors. Um, and neither in nor out a way to describe the condition of Jews in diaspora, a way to reveal the already dissolved and passable condition of this most ordinary border and the ability to exist upon it, within it, back and forth across it. I noticed Piatigorskaya's sensuality and joy at human connection. Quote, there is something here in the hurry and tumult of the tramway, in the rhythmic movement of this great knot of people, end quote. And she reckons intimately with time's fleeting embodiment, inhabiting briefly the moment of encounter. Quote, time brushed against me with a wing. And even with her imperfect anarchism, like mine, Piatigorskaya's Poetics are part of the body of work that opens space for Yiddish to signal what it does and can in spaces like the one we're in now, for anarchists to find each other, not the only language, I want to say like really explicitly, not the only language, but as one tool for this. And once they've crossed the threshold um, into a punk venue, onto a farm, into an intimate space carved out on a plaza, to ask one another not to perform some absolute anarchism, but to do better, and do better for each other. Thank you. So I'm 
I'm sure there are no questions, right? Just kidding. Um, I'm sure there are plenty of questions. Um, I guess if you have a question, you can come and line up by one of the mics. I would like to encourage people who haven't already spoken today to come up and offer a thought. I'd also like to encourage women and uh, non-white folks in this space to come take precedence at the front of the line. Um, there are no wrong or stupid questions. Uh, let's start over here. I have a question for Ben Gidley. Um, in terms of the internationalism of the Yiddish-speaking um, people in London and England, um, what were their attitudes, if any, toward British colonization of Ireland, India, Africa, and the Caribbean, if they discussed that? Um, that, that was a... Um, that was an issue that they did discuss. They were, it wasn't um, a kind of high priority issue for them, but they were very much um, anti-imperialist, anti-colonialist. Um, Ireland was a, was a key factor. And I think some of the uh, closest relationships between the Yiddish uh, radicals, both anarchists and socialists, and people in the kind of English-speaking movement were with Irish radicals in, in Britain. And there are results of also practical connections with Egyptian and Indian um, radicals who were living in London at that time, and then later um, Caribbean and African radicals in the between the wars. So it, yeah, it was a it was an issue. Cool. How oh, about the second person online right here? Me? Yeah, go ahead. Oh, okay. Hi. Um, so my question is on the the last subject that was spoken about. Um, so I've heard of Lenka Flegel before, um, and you know, I understand it's a, you know, a cute name for a chicken farm and things like that, um, but when we're talking about anarchism, we can't separate it, at least from my understanding, from my interpretation of anarchism, we can't separate it from an obligation for anti-oppression, and that, that includes both humans and non-humans. Um, so the purpose of any chicken farm, as far as I can tell, is to, is to sell and make profit from the, the bodies of the animals or the products that these, that these confined animals make. So how would you, uh, how would you address this, you know, this um, perhaps schism that I see between an obligation for anti-oppression and um, it, and uh, the, the use of Yiddish language that, uh, that might even border on a, appropriation to me. Um, thanks, yeah. Um, that's really real and it's really hard and uh, I am, I want to speak about this in a way that feels true and I also don't want to speak for, you know, a project, to, I don't want to exactly speak for a project with which I'm not involved. Um, uh, yes, there's like many lines of tradition of vegan anarchism and I think like our whole culture is carceral on a lot of levels and undoing that multiply and for everyone, like in my understanding is part of like anarchist liberation. Um, yeah, and it's really messy. Uh, I don't, I don't feel like I have a justification per se. Um, I think that figuring out how to engage with uh, tradition and the violence in tradition, even in like traditions that are really generative is really hard and is something that like needs naming and needs reckoning with. And um, I gain a lot from like, from reading and thinking with uh, traditions of vegan and vegetarian liberation politics broadly and anarchism specifically. Um, and I also gain a lot from thinking uh, with comrades about what it means to build uh, a space of collective choice uh, or like sort of uh, communal thinking through and building, uh, say, like, what the space will look like for a weekend or for a season, et cetera. And, like, yes, I absolutely recognize the contradictions you're talking about. I wish I had a resolution, and I don't. Yeah. Thanks. Mm -hmm. 
Um, how about right over here, and then we'll come back over here. Hi, my question is for Deanna. Um, so in talking about diaspora of Yiddish tradition and language, um, and thinking about uh, like how Yiddish is used performatively in these spaces that you described, and also in like general anarchist spaces as, um, you know, I like the image of it being a flag. Um, do you think that there is any space for a pidgin Yiddish, like a, a, lang a language that like comes from the, the, like the mixing of etymologies of languages or as like a quote unquote watered down version of an official language, even though pidgin languages are also real languages? Yeah, I'm just thinking about like in terms of linguistic and cultural diaspora, um, if they're like, in your experience seems to be kind of room to create a new language that builds from traditional Yiddish and also from like this kind of performative Yiddish. Yeah, I do. <laughs> yeah. Uh, we'll notice that we're at a conference about Yiddish anarchism that's in English, so it's accessible to more people. Um, but also like in a really deep and serious way, like an amazing thing that happened to me in Pittsburgh a couple weeks ago is I was at a Shabbos dinner and uh, my friend who was like organizing the songs got a bunch of like very cool like non-Yiddish speaking anarchists to sing like Cheery Bim together and it was amazing and everybody was like bumbling through it because not everybody speaks Yiddish and one of the things that I mean and also you know Yiddish is and has been derided as like jargon and like mm -hmm you know, not a real language itself. And I think that like creating more spaces for more modes of like engaging meaningfully with all the different ways that culture exists and shifts and changes um, is to me like a practice of moving with and like continually evolving with rather than like asking a culture to be some static thing that is only accessible to the people who get it right. Yeah, uh, an idea which has been brought up in all the three sessions identified anarchism with the idea of ignoring borders, that the world belongs to everybody. And in no case was mentioned that actually it's a very old idea. It's very, uh, it originated originate with Abraham, Lech Lacha. The idea that the way you get close to God is by leaving the place which is familiar to you and exposing yourself to other culture, to other dimensions. So I was wondering on one side, uh, anarchism basically tries to say that they don't have any connection with religion whereas when I find out that many of the basic ideas are deeply rooted in Jewish religion. Can you come and hold up, please? Yes, thank you for that uh, comment. Um, um, I think we, uh, we, di we do need to think about the categories we use and also about the category of anarchism uh, and where do we draw the boundaries and it has, it has been said um, so, sometimes um, this today that uh, that biographies were not always clear um, that people switched from socialism to anarchism and back um, and I would um, I would make the circle even larger and uh, look, especially in, by the, in the 1930s, look also um, to the two religious circles. Um, even if it sounds um, in the beginning, uh, no, uh, it sounds foreign. To, to people who, um, who uh, occupy themselves with, with, anarchy, with, with Jewish anarchism, especially because of this dominant um, anti-religious tradition. But um, if you look in Freie Arbeiter Stimme, you, 
you find this debate. So we, we, we take what we have and we, we have to recognize that obviously um, people were interested in the spiritual tradition. Obviously people went to Chabad Lubavitch who was new in Brooklyn and obviously they, they had some thoughts. We don't know uh, everything about, uh, they, not, everybody, not every one of them wrote in Freie Arbeiterstimme, but we know that there's this debate. We know it was very heated. Obviously it seemed to be a, a big problem. And this is interesting. Obviously, um, Chabad had some followers that came from the free thinking uh, area, and um, that's why I'd uh, expand the, the 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 concept that, uh, or yeah, just um, the the boundaries of uh, uh, Jewish anarchism that uh, that are uh, fixed by certain uh, um, points like. Stateless um, or the anti-statism or uh, anti-violence. Um, of course, anti-violence was also disputed. Um, there are core themes, but uh, I think, especially in the 1930s, the the approach towards religion changed and uh, towards the religious tradition. If you look, you can also look in in Germany to Buber and Martin uh, Martin Buber and Gustav Landauer who occupied with um, with the Hasidic occupied themselves with Hasidic texts um, Buber himself wrote on religious socialism um, he was sometimes considered anarchist but that's that's a problem that we have where do we draw the boundaries is somebody when when is somebody when uh, anarchist and when uh, when do we have to consider him a socialist thank you <coughs> we have at least 15 to 20 more minutes for this. So if you have a question, make sure to get online. Um, let's go over here and then back over here. Um, first of all, thank you so much. This has been so incredible. Um, I have a sort of similar question of, I'm curious why, when this anti-religious thread started and, and why, or if, if it was a shift or if, I don't know if that was just always present and also if there were non-religious um, spirit, like practices of spirituality um, present in like Yiddish anarchist culture, Yiddish culture, um, historically or also today. The first one was when when did uh, these um, when did the interest these interests start? Um, well, you have a debate in the forwards that was uh, already in, in the nineteen tens in the beginning of the nineteen tens, where um, uh, where yeah, where obviously when you have a debate, then people realize that. Uh, their <coughs> opponents um, turn towards, or at, do not turn towards this tradition, but um, at least they they uh, they do not reject it wholly. Um, so it probably started in the 1910s. Um, maybe Tom Goyens can can say some um, can correct me, but um, I'd say before you said 19 until 1909 um, were these Yom Kippur Bella, but Definitely for the time 1880s uh, till the 1900s, 1903, definitely the atheist tradition was very strong and it also clearly separated Jewish anarchism from, from Jewish socialist, uh, other so Jewish socialist groups. Now your second question, uh, I cannot answer yet. <laughs> uh, um, because I'm just mi missing the missing the sources, I can um, and I can't um, give you a name who deals with uh, non-religious spirituality, uh, especially in the circles we are speaking about now, 1930s, 1940s. Can I just add yeah, a couple of, of words of in the London context? Um, in the 1870s and the 1880s, uh, militant atheism was a huge part of the anarchist scene, but it was also a big part of the socialist, social democratic scene, so a lot of the big Yom Kippur bulls in London were actually social democrats and not anarchists. And I think after, in London, after the 1900s, um, that kind of militant atheism really dropped away quite 
um, significantly. Uh, Kishinev was a factor in the kind of um, return to kind of a uh, sense of uh, Jewish kinship. Um, but um, I think for uh, the shift from Johann Most as the kind of key influence on Jewish anarchists in the 1880s to Rudolf Rocker. Rudolf Rocker had no interest in kind of, he was an atheist, but he wasn't like a, a particularly keen on kind of a militant atheist kind of denunciation of organized religion. And he was very keen to kind of involve religious Jews, religious people in the kind of, through the trade union movement in, in anarchism and kind of have a much more open approach. Mm -hmm. And in the margins of that scene, so I mentioned this printer, Naroditsky, who was a kind of anarchist Talmudic scholar. Um, and there were a whole bunch of these kind of interesting sort of autodidactic and, and kind of uh, yeshiva educated um, kind of people developing different kinds of fusions of Judaism and anarchism um, from the, I think from the 1910s onwards. Hi, uh, my question is uh, for Diana. Um, so you brought up a few examples of, uh, you know, uh, queer Yiddish anarchist projects, um, and I've been, I mean, I did a lot of research on, like, the evolution of klezmer in America uh, over the past semester, and I read an essay by Alicia Spiegels of the Klezmatics from, like, 2002 that discussed how the Yiddish revival movement has a distinct, uh, queer aspect to it um, that, uh, you know, you're seeing more and more klezmer bands that have a uh, unique queer focus, uh, Yiddish poets that are talking about queer and trans issues. And I, I was wondering if you could uh, talk about what has driven this uh, intertwining of queerness and Yiddishism or whether it's a new thing or an old thing. <laughs> Um, well, uh, um, I think, uh, Kenyon, I think you pointed out maybe, but I, maybe at another time, Anna heard you give a talk about a person whose name escapes me, who, uh, got a degree in medicine and, uh, was the basis for Yentl. Uh, oh. Dr. Katerina Yevzorov Marison. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Um. Uh, and I, I've, I bring that person up um, because this sort of like famous, infamous, I don't know, um, Yiddish short story um, about a person who, not to necessarily map contemporary language onto it, but like shows up at yeshiva in a gender that they were not assigned um, to study and like have erotic experiences that would be otherwise inaccessible um, is, uh, it's just to say like that there's like one, exa one example. Um, I think more broadly, you know, yeah, if we read into the tradition of uh, Yiddish poetics, um, you know, Zohar, uh, Wyman Kelman just put out a really beautiful book on uh, queer Jewish poetry with a lot of um, queer Yiddish in it particularly. Um, I don't think it's new. Um, I mean, I also, you know, I don't think that queerness is new. Um, <laughs> uh, and I guess, yeah, a lot of people are writing on it. Um, I don't feel like the expert on it in any way, um, but I do think that uh, the growth of one of the reasons that a lot of people have said to me that they got excited about Yiddish is because it uh, culturally articulated uh, modes of being um, that are broadly non-normative in the like white North American U.S. context um, that create more roominess around <coughs> expectations of gender and sexuality. Um, there's a lot more there, but yeah, I think it, it's long. Um, there's a lot, <laughs> yes. <laughs> Either of you is fine. Stay in Right over here. Um, this is also about Yiddish, as 
flagging. Um, so I live in the Pacific Northwest where uh, I've been able to see and be a part of sort of a growing like Jewish anarchist milieu. Um, and one of the ways that that has uh, played out is like in these frequent like street conflicts with fascists and with, with police like uh, bringing Yiddish banners um, as, as a way of like flagging and saying that like we're still here. Like this isn't just a forgotten historical scholarly pursuit, but like, like there's still Jewish anarchists and there's still like conflictual Jewish anarchists. Um, and, but both in, uh, yeah, there's, there's like conflictual ways of engaging in, in Jewish or Yiddish anarchism and as well, as well as more of the like the building and living ways of engaging in uh, Jewish and Yiddish anarchism. Um, and you, you said, uh, you asked how, how can we show up better for others? And I think that um, part of what's, what's so exciting about there being like the Yiddish flagging in these, in these street conflicts and in other aspects of our lives is showing up for ourselves. And uh, for me, like refusing the role as, a, a, refusing the role of the white ally in these conflicts um, and recognizing that like we, D like even despite like assimilation, despite like uh, for most Ashkenazi Jews, like several generations of whiteness now, like we still have something at stake. We still have skin in the game. Like we still have things to fight for. And um, and because I, I think that there's like a ton of Jews who participate in like anti-racist, anti-fascist movements, but not necessarily as Jews or not necessarily visibly as Jews. And it's a way to like also like call out to other Jews like, hey, what's up? We're here. Like. Uh, we can be here as Jews. We have something as, at stake here. Um, yeah, so that's, that's just what I wanted to add to that conversation. Yeah. Any? Cool. Right over here. Uh, to move up in class, Rupert Brooke, the Cambridge University war poet who was a dedicated Fabian. He went out and he gave talks, so he wasn't a dilettante. One of his colleagues was a Viennese Jew. He wrote letters to him back and forth and he visited him in Vienna. And I, I'm just wondering, he was probably a, a foreign student, possibly not of that, you know. It's the class issue. You didn't mention Fabians, maybe that was, you know, I think of them as soft anarchists. Uh, there were people in the educated group, and I'm sure Jews showed up at those talks and those lectures. Uh, so isn't that a, also a part of it? And, and was there emigres? I mean, Marx was a, he, a German died in England and Engels, et cetera. So this, a different uh, group that I, I thought I'd mention. Yeah, I guess there were, I mean, there were lots of multiple um, Countercultural spaces that were, some were much more elite, some were much more uh, working class, some were very mixed, and they often there were points of connection between all of them. So there was a kind of current of kind of aristocratic anarchism in late Victorian and Edwardian England. Um, there were um, there were Russian aristocrats who were who were kind of involved in in the scene, um, but I think the feature of uh, Yiddish anarchism is probably the only in in the UK, the only kind of um, mass working class anarchist movement that there's been historically in, in Britain. Um, and it, it's, I think it, you know, really out, outweighs both in its significance and in its actual quantity, the kind of uh, aristocratic current. Um, I guess uh, kind of lifestyle, libertarian lifestyles um, that were championed in some of the kind of more aristocratic anarchist scenes were also championed in the working class um, uh, Yiddish scene, and in some ways, in the latter, it was much more risky. I suppose they had a lot more, a lot more to lose. Um, but the kind of things, uh, sexual freedom, um, uh, vegetarianism, kind of def uh, issues that were kind of central to the kind of aristocratic anarchists were also there for for the working class anarchists. Cool, right over here. We have time for all three of you. Sure. Um, hi, uh, someone had asked a question about religious anarchism, and if you're interested, I was happy to recommend some things. Um, you can also find me afterwards. Would, would you want me to tell you about that? 
Is that, is that okay? It's not to you. Okay. Um, so, uh, so there's actually a, a whole tradition of Hasidic anarchism. Um, and there's a series uh, being written right now of biographies of Hasidic rabbis, um, uh, which is being written by Kevin, uh, Kevin Chaim Rothman, who's himself a Hasidic rabbi. Um, he's been doing this work for quite a while, and some of it's starting to come out. Um, he's writing a biography of Rabbi Chain uh, and Rabbi Yankov Meir Zalkind. Uh, Yankov Meir Zalkind was a really fascinating figure who went to the Volozhin Yeshiva, uh, and then he devoted himself to translating the Talmud um, beginning in the 1920s. Uh, he published a whole series of pamphlets, uh, starting with the labor, labor tractates um, of the Talmud, uh, the idea being that the working class should have access to an ethics of labor. Um, and we know from reading the backs of the papers that he also gave all kinds of lectures about uh, the Talmud is a proto-anarchist document because it was about ethics without state power behind it, right? Uh, rather than a constitution, it was a different form. Um, and so Zalkin's quite interesting, and he, he published four of the tractates and finished translating all of it. He remained both a, both a fabrenta anarchist for his whole life and, and also a philologist and, and a rabbi. Um, at the end of his life, he settled in Haifa, and his vision was to create an anarchist society uh, to, um, in Mandate Palestine to free it from the British and create a kind of refugium, a space of refuge um, for, uh, for all peoples. So it's, it's, uh, there's quite a lot more to say about that, um, but uh, uh, Zalkind um, is one of the people who was trying to articulate a theory of anarchism based on uh, a Jewish tradition. And there was also jo Yosef Ludin, um, who is a... Uh, um, Russian and Israeli anarchist, and he wrote a history, a Kritzer Geschichte von Anarchistischer Gedank, about um, about uh, Yiddish anarchist thought, and he he goes back to Gideon and the Essenes and claims that uh, Gideon was the first Jewish anarchist because he refused to be made king. Um, he turned that down, and uh, he also wrote about the Essenes, this idea that this was a kind of primordial Jewish brotherhood. So thinking about all the genealogies of Yiddish anarchism and when they claim religious traditions. Um, and Emma Goldman, although in, in English she was quite universalist, uh, in Yiddish she had a lot of other things to say, and she spoke about Hasidim practicing mutual aid as a kind of form of uh, proto-anarchism as well. She talked about Moses Hess in his early ages was, um, was a Yiddish anarchist, and. And um, so she too, even though there, again, there's this difference between what she said in English and what she said in Yiddish, because in Yiddish she was articulating something kind of close to a, a spiritual Jewish anarchism. Um, there were a few others, but uh, perhaps you might be interested in looking into uh, Chaim Rothman's work about Hasidic anarchism. Sorry for crashing your panel. <laughs> right over here to... Hi, um, I have a question about the use of uh, post-vernacular Yiddish as uh, performative, um, specifically about how that potentially falls into virtue signaling and how we can both use this thing that is related to our culture and, um, or related to mine at least, that is fun and important and engages with your history while also um, not being exclusionary in nature because I think it carries a lot of weight about um, history and family, and I don't know if anyone's ever been on the Wikipedia page who is a Jew, um, but it is the longest page you will ever see <laughs> in your entire life, um, and how to, I guess, use this thing that is fun and tight and important um, while also recognizing that it carries that weight. That could have been more articulate. But. Yeah, thank you a lot for that. I think it's really messy, um, and Chandler does write about that some. Um, he talks about like going to conferences and peop seeing people greet each other in Yiddish, and then like continue to have whole conversations in English. And like, absolutely, there are like power dynamics around language access and facility, like ability with it. Um, I think this is making me think about a question that uh, Anna got earlier about uh, being like explicitly. Uh, explicitly affiliated as an anarchist rather than like practicing an anarchist poetics within like the frameworks that exist. Um, and I think that that can give a lot of possibility and context for like, yeah, what does it mean to be having a conversation that asks like in reckoning about Yiddish anarchism also to collectively maybe like put down a politics of like absolutism or purity or like a hierarchy of language ability. Uh, and I don't know exactly what that would look like, but uh, I think that naming it is really important because like, dismantling at all levels is really important, and I'm really glad you brought that up. 
Cool. Is there one more question over here? Honestly, my question was really similar, but it was mostly about um, the ways that sometimes I hear us talk about um, in Yiddish anarchist spaces about how um, using Yiddish sometimes signifies us as like quote unquote good Jews rather than the Jews who um, have ties to Israel or speak Hebrew or uh, Mizrahi and Sephardic Jews who don't have the same lineage. Um, and basically it was a question about like intra-Jewish solidarity. So like how can we use Yiddish anarchism in a way that like allows for other types of Jews? as I heard it was like, Microphone. thank you. The question as I heard it was um, how can people thinking about Yiddish anarchism uh, build solidarities and maybe specifically like Jews thinking about Yiddish anarchism um, build solidarities with other Jews, you know, and like how to sort of like parse the politics of like radicalism related to anarchism. Um, I don't I don't really have a, an answer, but just one um, interesting example, I guess, of um, of that playing out in Britain. I don't know how many of you know about Judas, who are um, you know, radical radical Jewish culture, who kind of celebrate a sort of diasporic vernacular. Um, kind of alternative, uh, non-identitarian take on Judaism. And for years they've been kind of producing a kind of countercultural position within the Jewish community. But in the last year, I think last Passover, um, the leader of the Labour Party went to their Passover Seder and it became national news. And so suddenly this kind of internal Jewish kind of identity politics started playing out on a national stage in the battle over, you know, is the left anti-Semitic? And in some ways they became and, you know, by no, it's not a criticism of them, but the way that they were taken up by some kind of um, anti-Zionist Jews who are very keen to kind of, uh, anti-Zionist leftists who are very keen to kind of dis, uh, disprove the kind of the left being anti-Semitic, they became the good Jews compared to the kind of Zionists who are the bad Jews. And this kind of really complicated politics that plays out in relation to that, that once our kind of internal Jewish politics get kind of taken out into a, a different stage, they take on different meanings, and that's a difficult thing to navigate, I think. Anything else from you guys on that? <coughs> really loaded question. <laughs> gives you guys time to think of more questions, because we have 10 more minutes. Uh, I'll, say, uh, I'll say one more quick thing, which is, um, I was talking with a friend last night who brought up to me this, uh, mm, a book that recently came out, whose name escapes me, um, about uh, British Jewish families um, and reckoning with like within sort of biological or like families of origin, uh, the fact that, you know, very often you get like a communist and an anarchist and a Zionist and you know, the way that like political affiliations just already do map onto, messily onto Jewish communities. Um, and uh, I think this actually relates to the previous question of, I mean, very much relates to the previous question about sort of like purity politics around access to Yiddish. Um, I really think it is asking for pe people like myself included to also put down investment in being more right and have more investment in being more in solidarity. Please go ahead. Yeah. I don't have a question. I have a minor observation to make, uh, which is, okay. A minor observation, not a question. I'm taking a class uh, at YIVO. Uh, thanks. American Jewish Short Story. It's being taught by Dr. Anita Norwich. Yeah. And, uh, <laughs> okay. And uh, we discussed Yentl. Uh, and I had never seen the film, incidentally. I'd only read the English, and then I read the Yiddish, and Dr. Norwich pointed out, and I think it's significant and fascinating, that the English shows Yentl becoming Anshul, the young man, 
and refers to Anshul as she throughout. But the Yiddish refers, the minute that Yentl becomes Anshul, it's er, it's he. And uh, this is minor, but it sort of explains a certain uh, affinity between Yiddish and queer and uh, sort of an open-ended attitude toward gender and uh, societal roles for men and women. And that is not a question. <laughs> Ruth. Um, I have a question for Lillian. I was interested in um, what you said about the two um, kind of ideas about what God was to um, religious anarchists and non-religious anarchists, the religion being the miracle, the direct relationship with the divine, or God is this insatiable, power-hungry, sort of hierarchical monster. Um, it's interesting to me because the, the first seems to express like a desire for a closer relationship with God and the second one for more distant or like non-existent relationship, but the second one kind of seems like a, I don't know, it really reminded me of, of the sublime, which I really love. I wondered if you could speak to reminded the you sublime. Reminded of the sublime? Yeah, like the kind of, a, a god who is very unreachable and, and frightening, and uh, maybe you don't want to get near it. <laughs> you mean Freud, Freud sublime? Um, I guess, uh, ooh, I don't know. I, I don't know enough about philosophy to um, say exactly who I'm referencing. I'm just, <laughs> Kant? Yeah, Kant. <laughs> <laughs> I don't really know how to answer because I didn't get the question. Um, you are interested in these... Uh, oh, I was just, I guess I was wondering if you uh, agree with that analysis or if you feel like it's not relevant. <laughs> um, okay, any thought? <laughs> um, what, what I did was um, I compared these different views on God, and of course, the, the classic view is the, the, the greedy one, that the distant God, and uh, that suppresses humankind. Um, that, okay, I can't get the line to the sublime, but I can get to the, to the other side. So, um, concepts of God that are closer to humankind is, for example, the one that I um, quoted, uh, you find that not only in Judaism, of course, in other traditions too. Um, and um, concepts can be that, uh, so what, what Gordon was uh, describing is the, that what keeps Judaism to, together is this um, ethic tradition, uh, tradition of ethics and um, moral principles. And he can, of course, he can draw it back to biblical sources, to rabbinic sources, to Middle Age philosophy of religion, um, but um, you also have diff you also have other more spiritualist uh, approaches to this, and then when, then that's where you get to Hasidic sources, for for example, Shneur Zalman, and the um, Likute Amarim, uh, and the and then you get to authors like Tenenbaum, who I quoted, uh, who go uh, who are describe God in a very intimate relationship with men, um, and um, it's about contemplation. So you have, uh, and, and then you also, of course, you come to the area of uh, poetry, where uh, the connect, the, an intimate connection to God is described. But I see that as differing, or yeah, uh, as shades of an approach to God that anarchists can have. Thank you. Thank you so much. Right over here. Um, I just wanted to sort of ask about, you know, I think for me a big part of discovering like and identifying so much with Yiddish anarchism more so than like, you know, I, I was an anarchist, I was Jewish, but like the, there was this big hole in like this whole cultural legacy and this language I didn't have. And a big part of it was finding a lot of these more modern musicians who've been like sort of doing translations but also writing like authentically new stuff like Orchestra Criminal, or Daniel Kahn, or Soy Korolenko, and I was just wondering if um, your thoughts on that, and sort of, I guess, t this touches on like the 
the evolution and like new use of Yiddish again. Um, and I was also wondering if you have any other like good music recommendations, like radical Yiddish music. So. <laughs> I encourage you to come to the after party because we have carefully crafted the playlist to reflect all of the things that you're referring to. Where is it? It's at East River Bar in Williamsburg and you can meet some Yiddish anarchists and some religious Yiddish anarchists and some anti-fascist rabbis and some communists and you can meet, and regular people too. <laughs> Sorry, go ahead then. I love your question. Um, I'm, I feel like I might be like, I, right, I'm particip, what I think what I'm really trying to say is like, I'm participating in this too, right? Like I'm up here because this means a lot to me and uh, not because I'm like singularly understanding of it in a complete sense. Um, uh, I do think it's really, I think the like collective asking in of Yiddish among like a lot of Jews looking for a way to locate themselves like religiously or politically or culturally um, and also a lot of non-Jews looking to locate themselves for other reasons that like different panelists have touched on. Uh, you know, right again, like that's one of the many uses of Yiddish. Um, no, I think I'm out. <laughs> <laughs> Conversation to be had amongst many people. It's great. Um, over here. And then we have time for one or two more. Thanks for this panel. Maybe I'll just sit down. Um, so I guess I have two complimentary questions about religion and like tradition. So like clearly the way that Yiddish, that we talk about Yiddish or speak Yiddish here in this room would be really different than certainly people would have spoken at 100 20 years ago, or that the vast majority of Yiddish speakers today, that context that they speak it in, which is one in, of like a very religious situation, whereas even if people here may or may not be religious, like this is a pretty secular situation we're in right now. And so that's like about, the, about religion, like in, in the 19th century among the left, anarchists, socialists, by and large, but not completely, it would be taken for granted that you were atheist, or at least like this enlightenment perspective that religion was hierarchical, was oppressive, was clouding the way that you see the world and that we need to cast away these uh, old myths and embrace the new. So what do you think about the resurgence or the questioning or the new situation, the new, um, that religion could take something new, could mean something different in the 20th century than it did in the 19th, and what you think about that says, what do you think that says about history? And then maybe the other people can talk about tradition also, because there's this question of like, certainly also there would, in the 19th century, there's this notion that tradition, traditional society was not open, was hierarchical, was oppressive, was something that needed to be overcome. And so what does it mean today that we look back to Yiddish and want to reclaim it is that a problem? Okay, thank you for this question. Um, I, I'm, uh, I'm ca I would be careful with uh, um, equal, equalizing or with um, setting as e equals enlightenment and the opposition to religion. We have the conservative, um, we have conservative uh, Jews who try to um, bring enlightenment together with uh, the religious tradition in the 19th century, so it's not always the clear um, a, um, Jewish anarchism and uh, the atheist tradition is a particular tradition. Um, but uh, looking at today, I think um, uh, the arguments that um, religious anarchists made in Freie Arbeiter Stimme to me sound convincing. Um, also, if, uh, if we look at forms of uh, religious uh, extremism or fanatism today, because um, they, if I can make, make up a, a category, they 
um, argued with uh, with individual responsibility. You have to. Uh, you are not allowed to suppress, suppress anybody. Um, wh whenever you choose to uh, to read traditional texts, then it is up to you to do that, and you can learn from that, and it can enrich your spirituality. But it doesn't mean any that you can. Uh, it doesn't have any consequence. Um, that you can um, impose upon your family, for example. So um, I still side with the religious anarchist uh, arguments. Uh, I'll speak very briefly separately. I've been thinking a lot about uh, rabbinic anarchism in Pittsburgh and a mode of thought there that's been really lighting me up is the idea that um, sort of the only position of hierarchy is that of God, which like depending on how a person interprets that uh, can mean a lot of things, but sort of this idea of that people, or that like beings on earth are not arranged hierarchically and that like rigorous ethics or, you know, profound mutual care or some like larger sense of shared meaning is the only thing that's elevated. Um, and that's a kind of strain of tradition in not specifically Yiddish, but like interweaving with Yiddish Jewish anarchism um, in the US in the early 20th century that really resonates with me. Cool. We have time for one more question. Um, yeah. Okay. Um, my parents sent me to an after school uh, secular Yiddish program when I was a child. Thank you. And um, what I remember most from it. Um, and what I associate Yiddish with is the wise men of Chelm and, and humor and warmth and love and from through that mutual aid and a lot of the concepts that I'm new to anarchism um, and I'm wondering historically uh, through the end of the 19th century into the 20th century how much mockery and humor and poking fun at capitalists or communists or you know, um, highly hierarchical structures might have been used in Yiddish at the time, and uh, if anybody's doing that kind of shtus now. <laughs> Judas is. Yeah. Right. <laughs> Judas, that group in the UK. Yeah, definitely. Um, yeah, the Judas certainly are in the UK. Um, <laughs> and, so and, you know, they look back to some of these early 20th century um, materials for, uh, you, know, you look at some of these like 19th and especially early 20th century texts and they, the use of graphics, the use of humor is um, a lot more kind of, it feels a lot more contemporary than in a lot of um, English language kind of press from that period, I think. Um, so certainly kind of uh, comedy, satire, um, kind of using religious texts and kind of subverting them, like doing, you know, anarchist Haggadahs, for example, um, is a huge part of the kind of Yiddish anarchist tradition. Um, thank you so much to our panelists. This was so brilliant. And